this is the most exciting thing I think that's come along in the electric power industry since sliced bread. And, and that may, you may think that's overstating it, but I've been in this industry all my entire career. And yes, autonomous vehicles are a wonderful prospect on the horizon. And yes, renewables and energy storage is just an incredible accomplishment on the part of so many different aspects of the industry. But community choice aggregation affords us opportunities as consumers that we've not had before. I'd like to give you a little bit of an introduction and then I'll introduce my panelists. Um, actually, I'm going to say this right now. I, as I said, I think we're really fortunate to have them. Uh, I, uh, Jan Peppers, on my immediate left, is the CEO of Peninsula Clean Energy. How many of you here are familiar with Peninsula Clean Energy? How many of you are in their service territory? Okay, not too many, but they all know about Peninsula Clean Energy. Um, uh, I'm also proud to say that Jan is my council member in the city of Los Altos and mayor to be, I think. Yeah, and thank you for voting for me, Jim. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's also, I didn't realize this, a member of the Bay Area Quality Management District. I know she's been a successful entrepreneur. She's taught an energy class here at Stanford. Uh, Jan, your uh, accomplishments are astounding. I'm really uh, uh, pleased to know you. Uh, the, the, uh, Lori Mitchell, the Director of Community Energy from San Jose, is relatively new. I just met her today, but I've been well aware of her accomplishments as well in San Francisco, and now for about a year? A year and a half, yeah. Kicking off the San Jose, um, uh, um, what do we call it, the, the, the Community Energy Department. And we'll talk about that a little bit, why that's set up differently. And then last but not least is Garish Balachandran. Uh, Garish is, the, is the, um, the CEO of the Silicon Valley Clean Energy. Let's see the hands for Santa Clara County. Well, we have a few hands that are going to be covered by these two, uh, by these two folks. Uh, I've known Garish now for a couple of years. Um, he's also got a brilliant background in serving local power agencies in California. Um, and of course, he runs the agency that serves my, my little town, of Los Altos. <laughs> And so I'm very interested in hearing what, have, what he has to say. Um, let's see, I have a few questions just that I think will be helpful to my panelists. How many of you live in these two counties? We've already been through that. Um, how many of you are here because they want to understand what a CCA is? Most of you all know. You, you, no problem. Well, because, you know, we get into nomenclature and we assume we, that everybody knows what we're talking about. Community choice aggregation. I have a quick figure I'll show you that might help that. Um, how many of you have questions you'd like to ask our panel? Ah, a couple. Good. So I want to make sure I leave time for that, and we will. Um, of course, I think you've chosen the right panel to be at this afternoon. Uh, these folks are offering programs to help each of you do something that will reduce greenhouse gases. Instead of the other panel, you know, that has a Nobel Prize winner over there and, <laughs> and other brilliant directors and, and professors, uh, they're, they're just talking about ways how to mitigate climate change. In this panel, there's things that you're going to learn that you can do about addressing climate change immediately. I mean, really, liter quite literally, from your chairs right now. Well, um, of course, I, and, and just in case there's any uh, word that gets out about my ridiculing the other panel, I was just kidding about that. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a little background on CCAs and, and, and hopefully provide some information that will be helpful uh, so that you don't have to answer all those, those kind of questions. Uh, I'm going to give each panelist an opportunity to give a brief overview of, of their organization, but really we want them to, to drill down on the program offerings that they have mapped out for their customers. Um, and of course, we're going to revisit some of those in detail, time permitting. We'll uh, open it up to your questions. Um, and then we'll give each of the panelists a couple of minutes at the end to provide some closing remarks. Um, so like I said, it's really easy to assume that everyone knows what uh, community choice aggregation is. And, but, and, and I asked the question incorrectly. Uh, it's okay to not understand what it is. It's a relatively new idea. It's been sticking around. We, we actually put it into the legislation after the electricity crisis back in about 2002. Um, but it wasn't really exercised by anyone in, except Marin County. And it, was, and it was a long time for them to 
to kind of get the ball rolling. There was a lot of opposition. The investor-owned utility uh, was not very keen about it. Uh, there were <laughs> so few heads shake back there. In fact, we had to pass additional legislation, I think, in 2006 to stop the investor-owned utilities from spending money to lobby against community choice aggregation. Well, that didn't stop them. They went ahead and ran a proposition, spent almost $50 million. That proposition failed with very little money uh, uh, against the proposition. But, but just to give you a sense, CCA has been around for a while. And in, in the simplest terms, if I may, many of you have seen this figure before. This, the, the, the utility, the investor-owned utility, is still delivering the electricity. Um, they still provide the wires. Um, but the procurement basically ends up in, in, the, in the hands of the local agency. In most cases, a joint power authority that's created by the county or the cities involved in that county. Um, and Silicon Valley Power, I'm sorry, Silicon Valley Clean Energy is, is basically every city in the county of Santa Clara, except San Jose. San Jose set theirs up more recently and separately as a department within the city. And then, and then Peninsula Clean Energy is the entire county of San Mateo, all 20 cities, I believe. So I'm not going to say much more about that, except what we want to talk about today is how this is growing and we've been, we've been discussing this at, at almost every one of these energy summits for the last four years, I think. Um, and you can see from this map, and I apologize, it's very difficult to read, but it, it gives you an idea that, that this, is, this is a snowball that's gaining uh, a lot more mass and velocity as it rolls downhill. Um, they provide, lo CCAs provide local control. They, they, uh, they set community goals for the organization. Uh, uh, they, they procure the re renewable content that, the, that their boards determine, their local boards, and they also develop programs that serve consumers. And as I said, that's what we're going to try and concentrate on today. Let's see. Uh, here's a list of all the CCAs in California. Of course, I don't expect you to read that. There's been some some um, arguments against community choice aggregation early on that it wasn't it was going to do this it was going to do that but the and one of those um, negative comments had to do with the fact that uh, uh, it really wasn't going to be renewable energy they were going to they were going to primarily do uh, renewable energy credits uh, it wasn't going to create any demand for new renewables in the state they'd just be gobbling up what's there and make procurement for the IOUs difficult a lot of different arguments or variations on those tunes but the reality is CCAs are putting a lot of renewable energy on the map and you can see I've just taken some material from the, um, the CCAs um, Trade group, what do we call it? Cal CCA, trade group. Yep. Um, and and so you can see that a lot of new generation has been built as a result of CCAs just in the last few years. Um, and I and I guess I just wanted to emphasize a couple of numbers here. Um, uh, I can't even read these on the bottom of my screen. The, the this is also put out by Cal CCA. And you can see that the, the number of customers and the total load, estimated peak load, I think we're getting close to about a third of the state now um, is part of a CCA. And this momentum continues to build. The, their, the, you can always opt out of this anytime you want. And you can see that they've retained on average 94% of their customers. Their renewable uh, portfolio standard um, minimum on average is 43%, and most of these boards have goals to go to as much as 100%. I think that's all I have. I'd like to, to just go ahead and, let's see, I went through background format. You know, I, I think I'm missing some pages here. Okay, no, that's it. So, so what I'd like to do is ask each of you to give some introductory remarks. I apologize if I spent too much time. I hope that information was helpful. Um, I'm not running a clock like I did at the debate hour. This is your panel. You'll hear very little from me for this point on. But let's do that. Tell me a little bit about your organizations and the programs that you highlight some of the programs. You don't have to do it all right now, but go right ahead. We'll, have, we'll start the veteran off first, Ms. Pepper. Okay. 
Thank you, Jeff. And thank you all for choosing this, this panel to uh, listen to this afternoon. So uh, I'm Jan Pepper. I'm the CEO of Peninsula Clean Energy. We are a CCA covering all of San Mateo County, which is all of the 20 cities and towns in the county, plus the unincorporated county. We launched in 2016 and enrolled our customers in two phases, the first phase in the fall of 2016 and the rest of the customers in the spring of 2017. So we've been serving all of our customers for two years now. Uh, we offer two products. Our default product that everyone was automatically enrolled in is 50% uh, renewable and 90% greenhouse gas free. And our goal is to have that product be 100% uh, greenhouse gas free by 2021. And we also have a 100% renewable product that our customers can opt up to. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Yes. Okay, good. Um, and we price our, our default product, EcoPlus, at 5% below PG&E. So we've done that from the very beginning. I've always felt that people are interested in having cleaner and greener products. They're particularly interested in saving the green in their wallet. And that if you have a better product but that's also less expensive, then uh, you'll have great participation. And we have. We've, we have an opt-out rate of 2.4%, which means... Uh, only 2.4% 2, 2 of our customers have opted out and returned back to PG&E as their um, generation provider. Um, so with the 5% discount that our customers enjoy, uh, they save about $18 million a year. So that's $18 million that can go back into the community rather than going into um, PG&E's uh, bank account. We are very um, interested in growing renewable energy. We've contracted for two new solar projects. One is a 200 megawatt solar project in Merced County called the Wright Solar Project. We broke ground on that last year and we expect the production from that to start at the end of this year. And the second one is a 100 megawatt solar project in Kings County where we'll be breaking ground on that later this fall and that will start delivering to us at the end of 2020. And we're in, the, in negotiations with a number of other renewable energy, uh, large renewable projects, and we will probably also, also be um, contracting for some energy storage, and we'll likely be announcing that in the next three to four months as we finish up our negotiations. Our overall mission for um, PCE is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And in San Mateo County, uh, because we exist there, the GHG emissions due to electricity are now down to about 8% of the county. The biggest emitter of, uh, or the biggest contributor of GHG emissions is transportation. And so the energy programs that we have started up are um, targeted a lot towards transportation. And then building natural gas is the other big component, and we started some programs on that too. So um, that's, that's mainly what we're doing. As far as the, I don't know if you want me to get into all the programs right I'll now. I'll give you or have plenty a, of time. I'll give you plenty of time later on, okay? Okay, so we'll, we'll stop there and then, then I'll describe in more detail what our programs are. So, Ms. Bishop, I'm going to flip over you, come to you as, sure. the, as the rookie in the, sure, in no the crowd. Sure, no problem. Yeah. She's the not newbie. really a rookie. She's just the new kid on the block. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The new kid on the block. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's fine. Go ahead. So, so <laughs> let's, let's, go to, let's go to Garish and, and let him talk about Santa Clara, and then we'll go do San Jose last. Yeah, I think Jeff was going in order of when the CCAs were formed and we went live. So, PCE went live first, and then we followed in 2017. And we did it in two phases. Uh, so, you know, though most of you seem to know about CCAs, I wanted to just start with uh, why we got formed. And I have one of my board members here, Rod Sinks. Uh, and I remember when I was looking for CCAs, and actually, there's an opening here. Do I want to join a CCA? I went to uh, YouTube and I was looking at stuff and I saw panel that I think you had that he was on. I can't believe it. Rod Sings? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this was, you know, I think like 2015 or 14 or something like that, where you're talking about this. So all these cities had these climate action plans, and they kind of realized, oh, in order to control our emissions, 
going uh, cleaning up electricity is you know an easy way to get it down fast and so uh, we got formed uh, SVC was formed 13 agencies we're the first CCA to claim to be 100% carbon free and for those who uh, are really into you know what's the definition of carbon free etc I'm gonna say we're essentially carbon neutral uh, because where our industry is going is hourly balancing, et cetera, which we can get into later on. But we are the first ones to get to 100% carbon free. Our product is 50% renewable, 50% carbon free. And over the last two years of operations, we've returned $20 million of savings through uh, providing this electricity at 6% and 1% less than PG&E's rates. We love this. Can you, uh, uh, we'll play, can you top this later, okay, Ms. Pepper? But you know, this is fantastic. We, we did top, because we do 18 million a year. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, it's okay though, I'm one of his yeah. customers, so I, I, I so like to say There is a balance between <laughs> spending a little bit more to be 100% carbon free, which uh, PC will be getting to in 2021, uh, but we've been there from 2017. <laughs> Uh, See, we love this because as, regula as a former regulator, and, and you know, we pass laws to try and require the state to do this, and this is what I love about this. Now right. CCAs are doing it because this is what your communities want. Right, and there is you know, lots of friendly competition even within the cities that we have on our board as to who's doing different programs uh, first. So from a program standpoint, in terms of money, our board decided to set aside 2% of revenues for program funding. Now, all the customers in our territory still get access to PG&E's public benefits. So, you know, there's somewhere like 4% of their total bill, 4 to 5% of their total bill is still available to them for program funding. So that's uh, quite a bit. We've just added to the amount of funding available for programs. So when we looked at decarbonization and we created what we call a decarbonization roadmap that our board approved last December that we are going out through 2050 and then we set a goal for 2030, how are we going to meet it and what sectors are we going to go after? So obviously electricity is one and what we have today in terms of clean electricity is going to change as we invest in new power plants, renewable plants. So we've uh, signed contracts for three long-term renewable uh, PPAs. Uh, one's wind and two are solar storage. And these are the, one of the largest solar storage uh, that uh, has been contracted for in California, till I'm sure San Jose starts their contracting. <laughs> <laughs> so we looked at the different areas, this electric power, cleaning that up, and then there's the mobility or transportation side, and then the built environment side, which is buildings. So we want to influence uh, lowering emissions in each of those areas. And right in the center of these three areas is an area we're calling grid innovation. Because when you think about uh, mobility and buildings, there's a certain interactivity between the buildings and the grid. And so that's the other area we're looking at. Um, so I'll get into the programs under each one of these later on. So, Ms. Mitchell, I meant no offense by calling you a rookie. Garish <laughs> no said problem. it much better than I did. You're the newest. And yeah. so I thought it would be best if you went last. But please tell us about San Jose. Yeah, sure. No, thank you so much for including us. So, um, I'm Lori Mitchell, and I'm the Director of uh, Community Energy at the City of San Jose. We're organized a little differently than some other CCAs in that we're a department within the City of San Jose. Um, San Jose decided to do that because they're a fairly large city, and they have a lot of scale just within uh, the City of San Jose. If you're, most of you probably are familiar with San Jose, but just a couple of key facts. Um, so San Jose is actually the 10th largest city in the United States. So we're just about 1.3 million residents that live there in San Jose. So pretty large uh, population, very diverse. Um, and San Jose really uh, was interested in, in forming a community energy department because they saw the success of many other cities launching CCAs and 
because of a lot of advocacy um, from many of our residents around really wanting to do something to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So Ruth Marino here was one of those residents that was at many of our city council meetings. Um, so our council really took that on and in parallel they worked on what we call our Climate Smart San Jose plan, which is our sustainability plan that aligns with the Paris Agreement. Um, it has unanimous city council support. It's a very ambitious plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the city of San Jose. Um, there are many different pillars in the plan, but one of them is to get to 100% carbon-free by 2021. And so that was very much one of the reasons they wanted to form San Jose Clean Energy. So um, they unanimously approved uh, forming the department in May of 2017. I came on board in November of 2017. Um, we launched service in three phases, actually. We first did a very small phase with just our city accounts last September. Um, so that included San Jose International Airport, our wastewater treatment plant, all of our police and fire stations. And we did that just to make sure that um, all of our operational practices were in place before we wanted to scale it. Um, but then in February, we enrolled all of the residents and our, com our large commercial customers. So that was over 300,000 accounts in February. In February, also, if you were here for the last panel, pg &E announced that they were <laughs> going into bankruptcy. So it was definitely an exciting time, both for the community energy and in the energy space. Um, Definitely lots of interesting times in the energy industry. Um, but that was very successful. We have an extremely low opt-out rate. So we are just over, just a little bit over 1%. And so many of our residents have, you know, chosen to stay with us. Right now, we are in the process of enrolling our small commercial customers. That's also going very well. We haven't had any actually opt-out. So that's, that's great. You have had none opt-out? Not non-small commercial. Very good. Yeah, we're right in the middle of it, though. <laughs> so <laughs> knock on wood. <laughs> um, but we've done a lot of outreach to them. Um, you know, I would say overwhelmingly, they're very supportive. There's lots of small businesses within San Jose that are excited about it and and to market with us. So, so that's been very successful. Um, in terms of the products that we offer, we also offer two products. Our default product is 45% renewable and 80% greenhouse gas free. And we are basically competitive with pg &E, So we are 1% uh, lower on the rates. And in San Jose, that means about $2 million a year back to San Jose. We did that purposely to take a very conservative approach to make sure that the program works and that we can build up an operating reserve and provide um, financial stability uh, for the city of San Jose. And once we get a pretty healthy operating reserve, we're trying to build to 120 days of operating expenses. We'll look at other rate discounts and, and programs to offer. Um, and then we also offer a 100% renewable program. That's also 1% cheaper than pg and is offering. Um, on the programs front, we're a little bit behind my colleagues here just because of our launch schedule. But we do have a roadmap in place. Um, and where we are focusing is really programs that align with our Climate Smart San Jose plan. And in that plan, like uh, Jan mentioned, in San Jose, we know that the majority of our emissions really come from transportation. Um, if you're not familiar, many people call San Jose a mini LA. There's lots of freeways, and we have um, we know that there's lots of emissions associated with that, and and a lot of traffic and and transportation issues to work on. So we are very really focused there in the in the roadmap. So very soon you'll see programs from us focused on vehicle electrification and, and really improving public transportation options. Well, thank you very much. Thank all of you. So I could let you all go through your list, but I'm, that's what I'm trying to avoid because I'm just concerned that we may, you know, the, the eyes will glaze over. But let's go through them. Let's kind of see if this works, okay? It might not, but uh, uh, let, we'll go through the topics. And, uh, you know, we'll see who the opening bid is uh, for what your program is and see what yours is and then maybe San Jose's. And it doesn't have to be in that order. 
but I'm just looking, you know, it's the, it's the one-upsmanship that we're going to be listening for here. <laughs> okay. All right? So, for instance, you've I'll all mentioned, you, you've mentioned some of these programs already. Let's talk about one, uh, electric vehicles. You know, we're trying, cities are trying to reduce greenhouse gas use. Number one uh, producer of uh, greenhouse gases are, is the transportation sector. Cities are going after this in a significant way. There's all kinds of funds at the state level. The Air Resources Board is making funds available through different. The CCAs are now also doing this. So why don't you just, you don't have to take too long, but tell us about the programs that you're doing in your area. And forgive me, I'm going to be, I'm going to provide some insight here. This is your opportunity to talk to your customers and tell them what your programs are. <laughs> so let's 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 get a little one-upsmanship going here, Miss Pepper. You can uh, uh, the opening bid here on electrical okay. vehicle. Okay. Uh, Program. We actually uh, cooperate on a lot of these mm -hmm. things. Wait, so. cooperation's allowed? <laughs> That's, yeah, it's it the one really exciting part of being in the CCA industry is that we actually are not competitors, that we are collaborators. And it's, you know, we have more force if we join together and more power if we join together. So that's what that's what we're doing. Uh, but for us at PCE, we're very heavily involved in transportation. We put together an overall programs roadmap, and transportation is one of the areas. Um, one of the things that we're doing is called Ride and Drives, where we want to introduce people to electric vehicles. So we find a location uh, in one of our 20 cities, and we try to spread these out throughout the throughout the county to um, have dealers bring their electric vehicles there and people have the opportunity to test drive them. For example, I think in August, Facebook has a big festival at their campus and we did this last year. We had a number of vehicles there, Teslas, Bolts, uh, Leafs, all these different vehicles. You can drive the vehicles around and see what they're like and you're in an, a non-stress situation. There isn't a salesman there trying to get you to buy the car, but you can just see what they're like and, and see if you like it. So um, we did six of those last year. Our plan is to do 12 of those this year in 2019. And um, then we also have a um, new EV dealer promotion program. So last year, last fall, we offered, we put out an RFP to all of the car dealerships in the county and ask them to give us their best deal that they could for uh, plug-in hybrids and also for battery electric vehicles. And then we threw an, an additional $1,000 incentive on top of that, and we moved 120 cars with that deal. And uh, interestingly, the, we had just hired our programs director, and he actually didn't realize when he joined us that he was actually going to be a car salesman. <laughs> so... Um, but we actually, he does actually do a lot of other things. But it was just kind of funny because we were just pushing these cars. <laughs> and we're doing that again this fall. Uh, we're doing the same program. We've also expanded that program for the low-income community. So we've joined up with an organization called Peninsula Family Services. And for income-qualified folks, uh, we're offering a $4,000 incentive for a used plug-in hybrid or a, a used battery electric vehicle and Peninsula Family Services works with them to get loans and to uh, to help them get into a car because we want to make sure that this isn't a program that's only for the wealthy but that everyone has the advantage of, of having an electric car and experiencing the, the lower operation costs of that. We also have committed $16 million for EV infrastructure because if you have these cars out there, you need to be able to charge them. And we are in the process of selecting a, a contractor to work with us to uh, get the get these EV infrastructure out there. And we're, we're focusing mostly on multi-unit dwellings because about half of the housing stock in San Mateo County is apartments or condos. And if you've ever lived in one of those, you know, you don't necessarily have a plug right where you park your car. So we're looking at that and also doing a, an innovation program to find uh, technology that might be inexpensive and uh, and allow people to um, to pay for plugging their car in if they're in that kind of situation. And then we're focusing also on workplaces because if you're familiar with the energy industry, the actual the coal sale cost of power is lowest in the afternoon now when the solar is generating. Right. So um, we're hoping to encourage people to charge their cars during the daytime when it's least expensive, and we'll be working on rate structures for that as well. So 
I'll stop there. That's great. So, yeah, I mean, uh, Greece, isn't this one of the advantages of of community choice aggregation that you can tailor these programs to your county? Is is yep. is your I'm or in I'm sorry, in the case of San Mateo County, in your case, uh, six, sixteen cities or so, is yours the same program, or do you have enhancements? Uh, no, it's. Uh, I'll start with what Jan said. We actually cooperate quite a bit, and we share quite a bit Excellent. of information to make our programs better. So. Um, we're taking a little different approach in some areas, and in some areas, we're actually uh, going to do the same thing. For, for example, we're not going to provide rebates necessarily for folks because we live in a rather wealthy area, so we don't think rebates are necessarily the way to go there. Let's say 40% of our program funding is set aside for mobility, um, and we're setting aside about $8 million. So talk about some big picture pieces. The county has this program called Driving to Net Zero that they created a couple of years ago, but it's kind of high level, and there's still a gap between, okay, what that plan is and what individual cities can do. So we've hired a consultant to help with closing that gap as to what each city can do. Hmm. So they've met with every one of these cities to say, all right, what do you need to take it to that next step? So uh, the final report on that should be presented to our board in August, but the work's basically being completed in the next few weeks. Uh, additionally, if you want to move the needle on some of these things, uh, you've got to look at codes. And uh, so we have jointly with Peninsula, we have a REACH code uh, project. And basically, you know, the CEC has these codes that you have to, you know, <laughs> Title 24 and adopting it every three years. And so every city can do something a little more. And so Peninsula and us have funded all the background information that an individual city would need. So all the cost effectiveness calculations, model ordinances, etc., to adopt these reach codes. And so we have one for buildings and one for electric vehicles. And so that is going to be, uh, now the cities have to act on that and actually adopt these reach codes. So that's going to be planned. We hope the cities will take uh, action on that somewhere in the September through November time frame. So how does that benefit your, your constituents? How does that benefit the, the people in your community? Well, it's going to increase the amount of, uh, say, for example, charging infrastructure. So today you have... Uh, a certain number of uh, chargers and the kind of chargers that you have, uh, that's a minimum requirement. This, in many cases, will double the requirement because when you look at Santa Clara County, we have the greatest penetration of EVs in the state. And so when the state does their codes, they're kind of looking at an average for the entire right. state. Right. And we can't get to our reduction in emissions if we follow the state code. We have to do something more. And so we're focusing on low-income, multi-unit dwellings, and fast charging. Um, so those are the areas we're looking at. Uh, if I may add one more, we also have innovation is a big thing for us at SVCE. And uh, so we have an innovation program, and we're looking at a virtual power plant um, initiative. And so EVs and providing real-time rates is going to be one of the options that we look at. Uh -huh. So, um, Ms. Mitchell, I mean, both of these organizations that flank you are relatively new. I mean, they've only been in business for two years, or has it been three? And so there's a lot going on that they're trying to do. You just got started, um, but I'm sure you can top them in terms of your roadmap for what you're going to do for your EV, uh, uh, for, for EVs in for uh, the residents of San Jose. Yeah, no, I, I would just really echo what, what Jan stated. Um, well, you're not working together with them too, are we you? We are, we are, yeah. So, so one, I, I think, really fantastic thing about CCAs, and I, I honestly think it's one of the keys of CCA's success and, and why that they've grown so quickly is that there is a lot of collaboration, not just on programs, but a lot of operational um 
you know, roadmaps, if you will, you know, there, there really is a, a path that, that leads to success. And there's a lot of information sharing among all of the CCAs. And I think that makes us very strong. Um, so yeah, we are definitely plugged in with what they're doing on, on programs and, and very supportive of it. Um, but I will highlight just a couple of things that the city of San Jose and, and because we're a city department within the city of San Jose, we're plugged into that, you know, is a little bit of a different approach just because of, of the city that we're in. Um, you know, in the, we have a, a little bit of a different vision of where we would like to see transportation and, and electrification. Um, we're actually working on an EV roadmap that's a collaborative effort from many departments within the city of San Jose. And in the short term, we think vehicle electrification is really important in increasing charging, but in the long term, what we are really striving for is less vehicles on the road and more public transportation, um, more density in the downtown, more public transportation options to get into downtown. Um, if you're not aware, the city is working on you know, a pretty fantastic project at Deardon Station where Caltrain and Amtrak currently come into the city as well as BTA. Um, BART is going to be extended into Deardon Station, and we're also working with the High Speed Rail Authority um, to connect uh, down uh, into the Central Valley and LA from there as well. And so many people believe that that infrastructure will really change San Jose for 100 years. So it's a really important project that the city of San Jose is working on. We think it's really key to achieving our GHG emission reductions. Um, from the transportation sector, we really think that long-term key is getting people out of their single driver vehicles and, and using more public transportation options. So where we're focused is, um, you know, that last mile, other transportation solutions. Um, San Jose is also unique. At, you know, it's probably worth it to say that we're one of the, you know, probably one of the few cities across the nation that's really embraced scooters. <laughs> so at our last city council meeting, we announced an agreement with you know, a, a few different scooter providers to allow them access into the city and, and really embrace them. And many residents embrace those scooters in San Jose. You know, I work in City Hall every day and San Jose State University is right behind us. We see a lot of college students whizzing around on the scooters and, and have worked out um, you know, some rules of the road and, and safety measures to really make that um, a viable way to get around in, in downtown San Jose. You know, in addition to that, the way Deardon Station is being configured, we're trying to make it more walkable, um, you know, connect more bus lines from the Deardon Station into the downtown. You know, BART obviously will be a huge help with that. So, you know, at San Jose Clean Energy, we're really trying to plug into that. And um, where our roadmap will go is to really offer solutions that augment that vision that the city is trying to achieve. All right. I apologize. It's not your fault, but we're going to run out of time. We're not going to get to many topics here. So, Garish, let me open this up to you. It's, a, it's your, your choice. You want to talk about whole house electrification, uh, rooftop PVs, or energy efficiency. Which pro, what kind of programs? This is what, I, this is what we're talking about. Can what, I talk with something else? Sure. So, <laughs> your choice. <laughs> One of the things our board wanted us to do is do something different, right? So, and especially because we're community-based, we can prototype things. So um, we created this innovation on-ramp program where we basically, once a quarter, we just tell people, hey, pitch ideas to us, and we'll fund Clever. prototyping it. So we had the first one, there were like 15 ideas, we selected five. But there was one entity that came up with an idea which is way beyond our budget, so we took that separately to the board. So that essentially, I think it's pretty cool, Today, if, you, if you're a solar contractor, an EV contractor, or storage, and you want customer data, you basically have to fill out a bunch of forms, send it to PG&E, you get that data, etc. If you're a small company, a one-man shop, two-man shop, it, and you do a manual process, it's going to cost you thousands of dollars. If you're a rather large company, you can set it up, it's going to cost you $20,000, and then you can get the data in about 10 minutes. We're going to fund it where it'll be free for any contractor to do it. So it's going to level the playing field, um, and there's going to essentially, through an app, 
uh, if customer, if a small contractor signs up with us, they will get access to customer data. Of course, they'll have to authenticate, et cetera. <laughs> and if this works, we just hope it can be copied in other places. You know, it too. sounds small, but that's that's really a, a creative idea because oftentimes these are the kinds of things that hold up the innovative contractors and offerings. Correct. And so that's that's something that we So started. let me turn to Lori. Same thing. Is there something you'd like to highlight that San Jose is going to be offering that's going to really get this this crowd excited? You know, besides scooters, which I think is a big mistake. <laughs> yeah, we like our scooters. Yeah, lots of people are excited about this. I would, I would say just, uh, you know, kind of going on a, a little bit of a different topic. Um, one issue that the city of San Jose is really focused on is equity. And in particular, the city of San Jose is leading with racial equity in the GARE program, which is a national program um, where governments are really looking at institutional um, equity issues and, and you know what we can do to correct some of that. And so as San Jose Clean Energy, you know what we think where we're going to focus on, obviously we have to get up and running and build an operating reserve and, and be stable, but in terms of rates where we're really focused on our, um, you know, probably not discounts to all of our customers, although we'll probably keep the 1% to make sure we're still competitive and slightly less than PG&E. Um, but we will probably offer very targeted rate discounts. Um, we Just to give you a little flavor of our demographics, we have actually 20% care customers um, in San Jose, and, and so that's, that's quite a bit, but we know that there are quite a bit of residents that don't qualify for care, but so are there's, still... There's qualified low income. Exactly. Sorry, thank you for that. <laughs> if people don't understand what that is. Um, so there's many residents that, that don't qualify for those care programs, but are still very much struggling um, because of the cost of living um, here in the Bay Area, and particularly in Silicon Valley. Um, so there, there's a lot of work that we are, are focused on to try to reach um, that population and, and really provide more equitable access to energy for those residents. Jan, anything you'd like to highlight? What do you got coming up that, yeah. that would be of interest to, uh, to your customers? Well, one of the things that, that we're looking at is resilience. And you're probably all aware that pg and &E is starting a new program, the PSPS Powers Shutoff. I'm not sure what all the P's and S's stand for, but basically if it's very windy and there's a chance of a big fire, they're going to shut off the power. And so certain critical facilities need to continue to have power. So we're actually working with another CCA with East Bay Clean Energy on a grant that we applied for with the um, Air Quality District to set up resilience, to, to look at all of the um, locations in the county that would be an important kind of res resilience center like fire stations or libraries or community centers where um, people can go to be safe or that need to have electricity that can't afford to be shut down and to figure out how we can uh, economically put in systems like uh, solar plus storage or other types of systems to make sure that they have power if they're going to be shut off. We're also looking at some other innovative programs that I'm not going to share those ideas with you right now because they're still... Uh, you just don't want the people next to you to know about them. <laughs> we're still we're still working on it. So, um, <laughs> but trying to but thinking of other customers, say customers who are on medical baseline or who have you know, medical equipment that needs to continue to have the power operating if the power is being shut off by the utility. So what can we do for them uh, that's going to be clean rather than them going out and buying a diesel generator, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of trying to uh, clean up our environment? Defeats a lot of purposes. Right. If you have questions, go ahead and start lining up at the microphone, okay? Because I think it'd be a good idea for us to make sure that we yes. hear from them rather than just me. Mm -hmm. But I've got a lot of other things I was hoping we'd get into. Whole house electrification, rebates and incentives to build local renewables. Uh, what, what are we going to do about addressing more energy efficiency? Uh, these are the kind of topics that I know CCAs are addressing. But let's hear from you. What do you want to know? Do you want to know why uh, why it is that Peninsula Clean Energy is contracting for renewables outside of their service territory? You know, tough questions, easy questions. I'm just pausing to let folks consider what they want to ask. Please identify yourself and ask. Sure. My name is uh, Richard Rabbit. I'm an energy attorney 
the law firm I represent uh, developer clients who contract with CCAs to develop our projects. Uh -huh. So my question is sort of related to that. Um, I was curious to hear, um, before the PGE bankruptcy, there was this issue of how CCAs being new, relatively new organizations developing their creditworthiness and their reserves and so forth. And I wanted to hear sort of your perspective on how you, you know, moved in a direction to be able to be a uh, uh, counterparty and what your sort of, you know, what your challenges are in that area and how it probably should be. I know that the MCE has got a credit rating, so I assume that's another thing you guys are working on. And then for Lori specifically, since your structure is differently, uh, different, I'm curious to hear, does that mean the city of San Jose is sort of on the hook financially for the PPAs that you enter into, or is there some separate structure I'm curious to hear? So I know you're going to Lori, but I think Jan has something to say on this as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, PCE <laughs> received our credit rating from Moody's in May. So we are BAA2. We have a higher credit rating than PG&E. Of course, that doesn't. <laughs> this is a but competitive a higher, group here. We have a higher credit rating than all of the IOUs, actually. All right. um, <laughs> That's good. That's good. So, so. But we do have, you know, we do have a financial reserve policy. So we do, our policy is 120 days of operating reserves. Uh, we're doing our budget right now. I think we're actually at 225 days of uh, operating reserves on hand, and uh, I was happy to hear. Lori, say that you know one of the things that you're going to work on is make sure your reserves are there first before you implement programs, and that's what we do. That was the advice I got from another CCA when we first started out. They said, make sure you're financially strong before you start Good. implementing programs. So have a lot of money in the bank, and so that you can weather the storms because the energy markets can be volatile, and we need to make sure that we can, you know, follow those prices and still be uh, able to provide value to our customers. Lori, did you want to, did you want to respond to his question? Sure. No, I'm happy to. And, and yes, um, I think Jan, you told me that very early on when I came on board, make sure you get your financial mm -hmm. reserves. So um, I think that's great advice. We are definitely taking it. Um, and, and I think we're on, on track to build those fairly quickly, but just to answer the question around how we're organized and how that's, different or not than another CCA. Um, so yes, we're a city department within uh, the city of San Jose. But one thing that people, I, th I think, sometimes aren't aware of or just don't understand is that um, cities often operate what they call enterprise departments, so departments essentially that operate off of the revenues that we receive. So airports are a good example, um, both San Jose International and San Francisco International, our departments within in San Jose, San Jose, and then in San Francisco, you know, SFO is a department within the city of San Francisco. They operate on the revenues that they bring in. Uh, another example is water and, and wastewater utilities. So in San Jose, we operate um, portions of the city. We provide municipal water. We also treat wastewater for all of the city and then offer garbage and recycling utility services. Those are all what the city designates as enterprise departments where um, they are really stood up on, on the revenues that they receive versus what cities call often general fund departments. You think of those departments like your police, fire, library. Um, so we are organized as an enterprise department. So what that means for our energy contracts is that they can look to our fund to fund um, payment from that. They cannot look to the general fund and then vice versa. The general fund cannot look to our enterprise fund. Yeah. So that's how that works. You want to hold your, hold your powder? Yeah. Powder? We'll take another question. <laughs> Please identify yourself. Yes. My name is Doug Norton. I work with uh, North America. We're an engineering and consulting firm. And by the way, Jeff, I did come up from Los Angeles specifically for this session. So, yeah. um, Thank good. you. Thanks for coming. So uh, my question is... It's not very often you get three these three executives yeah. together in one place. <laughs> so uh, my, my question is more pertaining not to the specific programs, but the journey and process you use to get there. So I'm currently working with the Clean Power Alliance in Los Angeles, which will be the largest, although fairly new, maybe even newer. This is a competitive uh, space, isn't yeah. it? So uh, we're helping them to identify and select a series of programs. So my question is, can you uh, explain a little bit of the trade-offs? And you, I think there was discussion about a roadmap. Can you explain how, you know, we're currently doing some outreach with a whole range of stakeholder groups from environmental and labor groups to um, the board and the community advisory committee, we've got dozens, probably a hundred different ideas for programs. 
how do we sort through all of those to, to select the ones we want to implement, and how do we phase those in? So that's not exactly what this panel is about, but he came from LA. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, by the way, I'll give you my card. Be happy to share with you all the information we have and how we got there. Perfect. And uh, essentially, looking at what our objectives are. So, and what we want to emphasize, right? So emission reduction was a big thing for us. Uh, then it was uh, innovation. Uh, so we had about five criteria that we decided all our programs are going to be uh, weighed against that. And that's essentially what we did. And then you get a bunch of smart people <laughs> um, and look at a bunch of programs. And we also went through another public process. We had a customer program advisory group, and we had individuals from every agency uh, we serve uh, be part of that. And then we also had another group of city staff. So we had sustainability officers from all our different cities also participate. So there was um, input from the outside. and pass it to the CIV, and we came up with these programs. But the governance is challenging, isn't it? Because you really need you need to have everybody at the table. But that's the point of being a CCA, yeah. right? You can tailor it to what your community wants. Mm -hmm. So we'll yeah, let you ask another question, but after this gentleman behind you. I'm, I mean, I'm happy to talk to you further afterwards. Too. There you go. I, I think that's going to be a very valuable connection, both of those. and and. Uh, leave Miss Mitchell alone. She's a, she's a little too busy right now. <laughs> <laughs> Please identify yourself. You know what? I, I th it is on. Is it on? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Can you yeah, <laughs> well, so the program is, uh, first of all, which I have a question is about the EV charging. So, so let's talk about that you have allocated a lot of your budget towards EV charging and e-mobility. But when we talk about super fast EV charging, which has to come, we're talking about 350 kilowatts of like, five chargers. That's like megawatts mega already, right? Megawatts. And so you need a transformer, and whoever is trying to build it, if you're talking about office spaces, then uh, it's a lot of overhead expense. Are you guys planning to get into it as well? Are you providing any subsidy for getting the hardware set up for fast easy charging? And what's your approach to that? Yes, for our program, uh, part of it is for fast charging. And uh, we're still in the process of, of developing that. So I, I don't have any details, but I know that that is part of it, particularly when we look at low low power charging for uh, multi-unit dwellings. So if you have only a level one charger, for example, for your, uh, for your vehicle, but then you need to go on a longer trip, you may need to go to a fast charger to get fully charged up. So uh, it is part of our roadmap and I'd be happy to talk to you further and, or connect you with the right person in our organization to talk further about your question. Let me just address that. So actually the three agencies here plus the city of Santa Clara and the city of Palo Alto. Uh, that covers the entire, both e counties. Then. Exactly. Uh, we're jointly applying to the CEC for Cali VIP funding. Mm -hmm. And the bigger we are and the more we can show in matching funding, uh, chances of success increase. So there's going to be a lot of, there'll be money coming in over the next year to two on that. Uh, some of the money that our board has set aside is for fast DC charging. Uh, and this is part of our strategic plan where we've got this contractor to help us figure out where exactly we want to uh, site some of this DC fast charging. And we're looking at how can we do things like uh, Lyft and Uber drivers. How can we get them to get out of gasoline powered vehicles into this? So the location for the fast DC charging for those kind of uh, uh, use cases are going to be different. So that's something that we're looking at. So the, that's our next step. So I, I'm going to stop you there because I promised my, my panelists, and I apologize, everyone, that we couldn't do more, but I'd like each of you to take a minute or two. We're into bonus time now because we're, <laughs> we're cutting into people's breaks, and I apologize to everybody, but we're not starting up again until 
um, 350, so we're, we're, we'll leave you plenty of time. But if you will, um, uh, please take a minute or two and just your concluding remarks that you'd like everybody to take away from this. Who would like to go first? And do I have to call on someone? Uh, Lori, would you mind going first? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, I would just say, you know, thank you very much for, you know, joining on this panel. I think um, it's really important. You know, one of the, the great benefits of CCAs is that we can be very engaged with our community. So, you know, thanks for being here. And I would just encourage you to, to get involved in your community. Um, you know, I know in San Jose, we love to hear from our customers. We really want to be customer friendly and, you um, develop not only rates, but program offerings that are really responsive to what the community wants. And, and I guess, you know, one final thing, um, you know, we're also resources, um, you know, Jan mentioned that the de-energization um, issues and the public safety power shut off, you know, that's a, a huge um, effort that will go on this summer to make sure that our communities are aware of that and are prepared, that our emergency response is prepared. And I think one of the great benefits of CCAs is that we can really be a resource for that. Um, there's a lot of energy expertise. I know I'm spending most of my time kind of focused on that just recently, just to make sure the city of San Jose is very prepared for that. But I think that's one thing that um, CCAs really can be because we are such we do have such strong community connections and very local connections I think we can be a huge resource and really um, helping people understand energy issues but also be prepared when we see these types of challenges like the public safety power shut off issue um, let's go to your issue okay um, you know I think CCAs are not the answer to all our energy problems in our state, but I think we play a part. I think being an entity that is responsible to the community um, is a big deal. Um, you know, when I think of PG&E, they may be too big to succeed, um, whereas our size is, you know, we're not too small. We're we're pretty decent size where we can actually uh, provide some programs. And this whole power system of the grid is changing so much. Uh, we don't know where it's going to be 20 and 30 years from now. So I think, you know, having these 19 CCAs right now and even more CCAs, uh, and everything we do is transparent. We do it in public meetings. Uh, the community actually gets to have feedback in where we go. So I think... Um, we're really adding value in terms of different kinds of ideas that can be brought to bear when it comes to reducing emissions, whether it's transportation, buildings, or even uh, clean power offerings to our customers. And Ms. Pepper. Thank you. Uh, the one thing I would like to, to close with is that even though we are separate entities and we do focus on our own communities, there is a lot of collaboration between the CCAs. And in fact, uh, we, we talked about some of the programs that we're working on together here. We're also collaborating on procurement and the three of us plus two other CCAs have put together an agreement to uh, purchase this one product called Resource Adequacy together. And we're going to be looking at other opportunities to collaborate for other uh, power procurement, but it still allows us the whole idea of local control. And I don't know if any of you were here for the previous panel when uh, when one of the panelists said, "Oh, the the state ought to do all of that procurement." On the, we, we, uh, the PG&E bankruptcy. Panel. Yeah, yeah, we uh, we totally disagree with that. <laughs> and um, you know, we I don't know how many years worth of procurement experience we have just sitting here at the table, but CCAs do. Uh, do have people who have been in this field for a long time, and we all know what we're doing, and we work together, and we try to do what's right for our community, and we try to do what's right for um, for each other. So we're we're hoping that we can continue to have that local control be a part of what the future is, and that as the utility industry uh, is looked at in terms of restructuring, which is going on at the legislature and at the Public Utilities Commission, that um, there will be people like you uh, joining with us to help to advocate that 
the local control is very important and the, the procurement authority should remain with each of our organizations. So thank you so much for your attention and for being here today. Yes, and I'd like to uh, add my thanks. I'll conclude with one remark. Uh, I had told you at the beginning of the meeting, there are th beginning of the panel, there are things that you can do. Uh, I mean, we all know there's, you can go buy a, an electric car, you can change out your LED light bulbs. One of the things you can do with a CCA right now is you can go on their websites and you, you all live in these in the service territories of these three CCAs, and you can choose 100% renewable electricity at a, at a small incremental amount. I just don't understand it. Check the box. It's an easy thing to do. Um, and, and that forces them to go out and contract for more renewables, and essentially your all your electricity becomes renewables. Of course, you can go one step further and electrify your entire house and get rid of the gas meter. And I think that's coming too. And I know that programs are being thought about in that regard too. I've already started down that path myself. So please, join me in thanking these three CEOs that have come to join us today. Thank you all.